Hello and good afternoon to our new next new economy um, shortcut. Um, and we this time are cooperating with the OECD for the first time in this uh, sense, and we would like to continue it from time to time and join our forces to do these uh, shortcuts. And that's why um, Nicola Brandt has accepted and was ready to uh, moderate the session uh, as the head of the OECD Berlin Center with, uh, with whom we are cooperating in this by now. And I hand over to you, Nicola, immediately to introduce the topic and the speakers. Yeah, Thomas, thank you. It's great that we were able to join forces on your on your really good uh, format, shortcut, shortcut to the two now. And we are especially happy uh, that we are able um, as the OECD to present some of the key findings on AI and the labor market. I'm uh, very glad uh, to introduce my colleague Steinbrücke, who's going to give us uh, a short overview of, over some of the results. And then we are lucky to be able to discuss this with Ingo Isfording, who is a researcher specializing on the intersection of um, of uh, AI, the labor market, and education. So really, uh, what everybody, what is on everybody's mind? What will happen to my education and my job if AI advances the way it did um, in recent months and, and and years? So without further ado, Stein, I give the um, I give the floor and the screen to you, and we are very curious what we're going to do. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola and Thomas, for the introductions, and also thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to present. Uh, so I will share some slides. I will um, I will really be try and be very brief. I will present maybe six, seven slides, and uh, but there's a very big book uh, that contains far more detail. The employment outlook, uh, the OECD employment outlook 2023, which was published in July but which in itself is also a summary of two, three years of research that we've done at the OECD on the impact uh, of AI on the labor market and a research program that, will that we're continuing to work on for the next few years. So I, I think the OECD was quite early in terms of realizing that this was a technology that was going to have a serious impact uh, on, on the labor market, but also, uh, then, with uh, as, as you all know, in November last year, when we had the launch of ChatGPT, suddenly this all caught the attention of the public. And now it's very hard to open a newspaper without getting uh, alarm bells rung around the impact of AI on society more generally, uh, but also on the labor market. And so, this impact on the labor market is really what I, what I want to focus on today. Now, one of the first things that people always worry about, of course, is the impact on jobs. Um, and people are always worried about uh, the jobless future. This is not new. We've seen this previously with other technologies as well. But there's something about well, ChatGPT in particular, but also other AI technologies that is slightly different about previous technologies. And so maybe there is some justification to be worried again about what impact these technologies might have on the labor market. Now, we at the OECD actually did a, a, a study in 2022, so last year, where we surveyed workers and employers in seven OECD countries, and we asked them about the impact. This was in two sectors, in manufacturing and finance, and we, we really dug into uh, questions around what impact it was having on their jobs already. Uh, this went there, but also more qualitative research where we went in, into firms and asked about uh, the qualitative research and case studies to complement this more quantitative survey research. So th this is the first finding I think is quite interesting to present is where we asked employers what impact AI has had so far on employment in the firm. Now, I have to apologize for the color scheme at the OECD for this uh, publication because it's all purple, so I can't tell you which purple to look at, because that's far too detailed. But if you look at the biggest bar in this chart, it shows that over 50% of employers in these two sectors in seven countries say that AI has not had an impact on employment so far. So that's the majority of employers tell us this. And then towards the left, you see two bars, which are more or less equal, I would argue, is employers who say that AI has had a positive impact on employment, so increased it in the firm, and the other part, which says it has decreased employment within the firm. So they're more or less balanced. Overall, and this is also consistent with other evidence that we've done, uh, research that we've done, looking at more macro data, 
we find very little evidence so far of a, an impact of AI on employment, at least at the global level. But there are some interesting nuances here. First of all, the adoption of AI, I'm gonna close my window, apologies, um, there is, there's a bit of nuance here that need, that's important. First of all, we are at the very early stages of adoption. Adopt, the share of firms that have adopted AI is still in the single digits, I would argue, and it's primarily large firms so far. So we're at an early stage of what could be an AI revolution. The other thing which is very interesting is what firms are telling us is that they prefer to let staff go through retirements, through voluntary quits, and so, this natural attrition may mean it takes a while before we really see the impact of AI on job levels. And a final point that is also interesting is that employers do tell us already that once they have adopted AI, they don't hire anymore. So they grow with the same number of people. And so we might see far less job growth in, in firms, but also occupation sectors where AI has a big impact. The interesting thing is when we ask workers, they do seem to be worried about the impact of artificial intelligence on their jobs. So again, this comes from these surveys in seven countries, which includes Germany, by the way, uh, in seven countries in these two sectors, manufacturing and finance. And if you look at all the purple bars here, which add up, which show you that three in five workers are at least slightly worried about losing their job to AI in the next 10 years. And if you look at the very dark bars all the way on the left, it's actually one in five workers who is very or extremely worried about losing their job to AI in the next 10 years. And if I remember well from our research, these figures are higher for people who actually work with AI. So people who actually understand the technology. These worries might not be entirely unfounded. Now you may be familiar with some of the OECD's estimates of the um, risk of automation. We have recently updated some of these estimates to take into account the latest developments in AI. Now, the risk of automation here does not reflect only AI. It reflects other automating technologies as well, but it does take into account AI technologies as well, which the previous estimates we had probably didn't. If you look at this research, if we look at the occupations which are highest risk of automation, those occupations account for about 27% of total employment in OECD countries. So there's a very large share of employment that's in high risk occupations. It tends to be countries with higher shares of manufacturing employment, also kind of routine employment that have higher risks. So again, it is not just AI, but it's also to show that it's still certain occupations, low skill uh, workers who are probably at highest risk despite high skilled people now being exposed more to these technologies. One point I should make here, again, a caveat is this is a risk. This is a theoretical risk. It doesn't mean that these jobs are actually going to disappear. The other point, of course, is that AI will not only destroy jobs, but also create new jobs. But what is important, I think, is that we keep an eye on this. And particularly, because of the speed of the development in these technologies, which is very different, I think, from previous technologies that we have seen. Now, it is not all doom and gloom. There's also some very interesting positive findings that uh, emerge from our research. One of these is the relatively optimistic, positive feedback that we get from workers on the impact of AI on their jobs. So, on the one hand, we know that AI can help automate some tedious tasks, some dangerous tasks in the case of manufacturing. But if we are, we've asked workers about the impact of AI on performance, uh, on their job, on their enjoyment of their job, but also on their physical and mental health. And you can see that four out of five workers said that it had a positive impact on their performance. Three and five said it had a positive impact on their enjoyment of work. And you can also see with the purple bars again on the right of this chart, that in general, workers are very positive about the impact that AI has on the physical and, on, and their mental health at work. That's not to say that it's all positive. There are some risks too. For instance, we get some feedback from workers. Uh, in fact, three in four workers tell us that AI has increased work pace. Now, from our case study, some anecdotal examples that I can give of this is 
AI takes away a lot of the routine tasks, the, the kind of tasks that uh, where people can take a mental break almost. Those tasks tend to be automated, and so it increases the pressure on workers, and that's something that we have heard back from workers. Another interesting aspect of, I think, job quality is wages. And here, I think we still have a lot of anecdotal evidence. Uh, mainly, we are looking at this as a new research project at the OECD. What we see so far is that people who have skills to work with AI or people who have AI skills, they, they earn very high wages and they're in very high demand. But those tend to be a relatively small share of, of workers overall. When, again, in our surveys, when we asked workers about the expected impact of AI on wages, around 20% of workers said um, it would increase wages. About 25% said uh, they expected no impact. But 40% of workers told us they expected AI to decrease wages in their sector. So the expectations are quite interesting. It goes hand in hand with the fears also around automation. But one thing that we do know also is that AI is already changing jobs themselves. We have some statistics, which I'm not presenting here, about the share of tasks that are changing within jobs. AI in general tends to automate routine, tedious tasks, but it creates new, more complex and challenging tasks. And so what that means is that we also have a change in skills needs at the occupational level. And for workers, that means obviously adapting. So even if your job might not disappear, you will still need the skill, the right skills to be able to work with AI. And that's not just technical AI skills. Again, when we ask employers, what kind of skills are we talking about? They talk about soft skills and they say in generally, they need far more highly educated workers um, to work with AI. 50% of the workers that we, uh, that we surveyed that work with AI said that AI had made some of their skills less valuable. And the other interesting finding, which I show in this chart here, is that two in five employers on average tell us that a lack of skills is a barrier to being, being able to adopt AI. So companies need the skills to be able to adopt AI, and they say, a large share of them say they don't have that. You can see Germany is actually on, on the higher side of companies complaining that they don't have the right skills to adopt AI. So investments in education and training will be really critical to accompany this transition to a world where we have more AI in the workplace. And another interesting finding from our research is that the workers who say that have been trained to work with AI are also the workers who are more positive about the impact that AI is having on, on their job. While we're on policy, another interesting finding from our research is that workers who said that they were consulted or they work in companies where they're consulted about the adoption of new technologies are again workers who are more positive about the impact that AI, AI has on their jobs. Of course, in Germany, you're quite well placed in a sense because of the system of works councils and there has to be a lot of consultation with workers. And so our research suggested that's a very good, um, that this has a positive impact on on the effect on the eff effectiveness on the quality of uh, of the adoption of ai now ai also poses challenges to social dialogue um, partly because it changes the information asymmetries between workers and and employers it creates this uh, some uneven bargaining positions between workers and employers and so there are new challenges that ai poses also in the context where perhaps unions, for example, may not be as well informed about or understand these technologies as well as the employers who are adopting them. And so this comes on top of long-standing challenges that we already have with social dialogue and collective bargaining and worker consultation. I haven't talked about this very much so far, but we also know that AI raises a whole lot of what we call ethical challenges. I'm not sure that's entirely the correct word, but issues around bias and discrimination, issues around automatic decision making and you know the transparency, the explainability, the accountability that go paired with that. Uh, issues around data protection and privacy. Again, this is something that comes out of our surveys that workers are very worried about these aspects. Also some work that we did with unions. Again, unions are very worried about these ethical aspects. And here, again, because the technology is moving so fast, because the technologies already being used in the workplace, 
it really feels like policy is running behind on what's happening in the field. Now, the OECD, I think, again, was an early mover back in 2019 when we published the OECD AI principles that guide the development and the use of, of AI, not just in the workplace, but also more generally. Um, but of course, these are principles and they're not really enforceable. That being said, I think it's really important to remember that AI does not operate in a regulatory vacuum. We already have legislation around and discrimination. We have regulation around data protection, about occupational safety and health. And these apply to AI in most cases as well. But of course, there's an urgent need to make sure that that legislation is still up to date and that it covers all, all kind of cases uh, of the use of AI in the workplace. We are seeing also new regulation emerging. Um, we see this, for example, at the EU level with the AI, uh, proposal around the EU AI Act. Um, in other areas, we see more soft legislation being proposed. For example, there is a difference between Europe and the United States in terms of the approaches uh, to AI, but you can see that policymakers are moving. The other thing that I think is really important in this aspect, and I already mentioned the United States and Europe here and how they're having different approaches, but there is a slight concern that we need to be, that we need to avoid fragmentation in terms of our approaches and our efforts around AI um, and making sure that across countries, there's some kind of coordination about how we approach uh, AI. And the, the, the final thing I should mention, of course, being a researcher and at the OECD is, there are still a lot of things we don't know about AI, and there's still a lot of new things happening very, very quickly. In fact, we were working on AI in 2022, and as we were finalizing our reports, we suddenly get uh, ChatGPT appearing on on the labor market on, on, on the on the scene. Who knows what will be next? These changes are happening so fast that we really need to keep on monitoring the effects that these technologies are having in the workplace and how they're affecting workers and, and, and the quality of jobs and the quantity of jobs, but also differences between different types of workers. So we will continue to work on that and, uh, yeah, and come up with the policy recommendations as far as we can. So thank you for your, your attention. I think there's some discussion there. Uh, you need to unmute Nicola. <laughs> so, okay, let me try again. Um, so thank you, Stan, for, the, for this introduction. Uh, it became very clear that AI, well, has a lot of impacts on the labor market and what the impacts are depends a lot on, on education and skills. And so uh, we're very lucky to have Ingo Isporting here to comment on you. Uh, Ingo, you're a research director at our uh, at EZR, Institute for Labor Economics, and you uh, focus on both the economics of the labor market and the economics of education. So I'm sure your insights will be very valuable for the discussion we'll have after that. Please. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Nicola, for the introduction and also for the invitation to join this panel. Um, let me share my own slides. Okay, can you see that? Okay. Um, yeah, the OEC employment uh, out of 2023 a monster. Um, I put that headline here because it's really a massive report. Uh, it covers, so, so Stein just showed it into the camera and it's, um, so you really have it uh, to have it as a book. It's 250 pages, 70 figures and tables, 25 pages of references. So if you want to understand where the literature on the effects of, of this new technology, technological um, AI revolution, especially also the, the now more recent chat GPT advent, um, how is this? already affecting our labor markets under the surface and how it might affect our labor markets in the future. If you want to know what research is, is, can tell you, um, get this book and read it. Um, I had only three days to read it. I only got it right before the weekend. Um, that was, uh, that was a bit tough, but so, so what I just want to tell you today over the next five slides and five minutes is a bit of um, basically the main thoughts that came to my head when, when reading this. Um, so I guess the report really 
asks, although it is focused on literature, this may be the short caveat, um, it is focused on literature that mostly precedes um, the, the advent of this, of this much more salient large language models like ChatGPT, which everybody is now talking about over the past few months. Although the authors are also touching the absolutely most recent literature we already have regarding ChatGPT and, and CoSearch. But besides the small caveat, it absolutely asks the right question. So the obvious question is, what is the impact on labor demand and productivity? What do we have to expect? How the structure of jobs might, might change? Um, so Stan already put it very prominently in his slide deck now, what are the skills that are needed to adopt AI on the job? Not only to adopt it, but then also to benefit from it and not to be displaced from it because both possibilities might arise for the very same jobs. And then how, so which societal and political debate we have to, uh, we have to have to approach rising inequalities in labor market opportunities and productivity. But from, from my perspective, I think the most important and most interesting part was the question about the low rate of adoption of AI. I mean, coming myself from kind of the, the academic and, and tech bubble, um, I thought, earlier this year, okay, this will change everything. And at the end of 2023, our world will look, will be a different one. Uh, apparently now being in, in, in September already, this won't be the case. So what I think it's, it's really, really interesting to understand why there was such confidence and where this hype came from uh, in early 2023. And just to give you some figures I collected this morning, um, so just to what, what I mean by, by the hype and what is happening. So what you see in the, in the top panel here, these are simply, this is just a screenshot from Google Trend on searches for chat GPT. And of course there was nothing before the very end of 2022, nobody knew what chat GPT was. Then it was made public um, and it entered all the media debate. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody tried it out and Google searches for ChatGPT increased until end of March. But then what I would have expected would be, this would have just gone on forever and, and until the whole world was talking about ChatGPT. This is not what happened, but people seem to have lost interest very soon. And in April, it started already flattening out. Know? So you could say, okay, this is just because people then knew how to find ChatGPT without Google, but the same picture emerges if you look at, this is taken from a German newspaper, uh, from a new, uh, German tech news portal called Heise.de. These are actual um, access rates, um, so actual monthly visits to the ChatGPT page. That's the blue line here. And you see nothing, obviously there was nothing before the end of 2022, then monthly visits to ChatGPT increased drastically up to almost 2 billion per month in, um, yeah, in end of April, early May, and again, it started to flatten out and even decrease afterwards. So this is actually absolutely not what I would have expected given the potential of this platform. I mean, I have to tell you from my own work as, as a researcher, I'm using this stuff like dozens of times every day. It's even on here right in on my second screen. Um, this is the very short adoption of what we, what we've seen in, in 2022, 2023. But what about longer term trends? ChatGPT is just maybe the newest, the most salient part of AI, but, but Stan was already talking about a lot of, um, I guess had, had a much broader definition of what AI actually means. And so the last picture I took from a McKinsey report on adoption rates in um, European companies. And again, you see that adoption rates increased from, this is now a year on a yearly measure, from 2017 to 2019 and leveled off uh, afterwards. So what's behind this low adoption of AI and this maybe let's call it the hesitancy. Uh, the report is discussing a lot of reasons. Um, let me just try to, to sum them up into two main reasons and Stein might, this, uh, might, might have a different opinion here how to group them. But um, the one thing is firms actually are ta taking up AI but labor demand is simply not yet reacting. Um, this will be kind of the boring message maybe, um, and we would just have to wait and, until to see what, what happens when those 
labor demand effects might appear on the surface. Um, I found the discussion much more interesting that was about firms and workers lacking the necessary skill set to embrace AI. Uh, so AI, in whatever forms it may come, uh, is a technology that on the one side, so it, so what Stan already showed was that, that jobs differ very much in terms of how much they are exposed to the usage of AI. And, but being exposed can, uh, to AI may have very different meanings. It could either mean that the task you're doing is actually replaceable by AI, or AI can support you and can complement you in fulfilling this task. Um, and, and labor economists have a very structured way of thinking about that. So labor demand and also the wages that firms are willing to pay for skills will rise for exactly those skills, which can be supported by AI and which are necessary to adopt AI, but labor demand and wages will decrease for those skills, which are still exposed to AI, but in a very different way, in the way that they are substituted or replaced. Okay, so I was interested in what these skills should be that um, can be supported by AI, that can be complemented by AI, and which are necessary to adopt AI on the job in a way that you benefit from it. And as I didn't know what the skill sets are, I just asked ChatGPT uh, Chat actually to tell me. So I asked in, in brief, which are the top three skills that we should teach our students to adopt AI tools on the job and to benefit from it. And very much in line with, again, what Sal said earlier, um, those skills popped up. It was um, data literacy, critical thinking, and problem solving. And so on my very last slide, I want now to draw a line and, and want to make you to think about whether our education system in its current state is the place that um, is uh, well equipped to actually teach those skills that workers of the future will need to um, yeah, to, to adopt AI tools and to benefit from them instead of being substituted away. So from my reading of the literature and from my own work, I think this is not the case. So the current education system very much focuses on memorization and not the application of knowledge. So critical thinking and problem solving are not necessarily skills that our curricula um, are focused on. So we are at risk of preparing students to be highly substitutable workers with the current curricula. And I think one reason for this is that the current teacher generation itself lacks the skills of adjusting to the potential of AI on the job. So if you follow the, um, the education policy debate of the past month, um, you see 90% of newspaper articles focusing on the threat of AI for the traditional way of assessing our students. So either through term papers or through, through written exams, which all can be done by by a chat GPT much better than the students could do it. And there is, there is very few, there, there very few attention to the promises that AI offers to the teaching profession itself. So either through, through um, AI-based personalized learning solutions um, or just the automation of administrative repetitive tasks for which teachers are typically heavily overpaid, but which make up a lot of their hours on the job. And so I just put a line here, which I took from the OECD employment outlook itself. Um, education systems need to adapt to the changing demands of the labor market and equip workers with the skills they need to succeed uh, in the jobs of the future. This will require a focus on developing cognitive and non-cognitive skills. This is a very, th these are terms which are very much taken from the economics literature. So think of it also on a year about problem solving. Uh, and, uh, and critical thinking. So these skills that are complementary to AI and other emerging technologies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ingo, for making, building the bridge, so to speak, to the uh, education system. We are already getting uh, questions from the audience and I did want to assure you, so keep them kind. <laughs> Let them keep them coming. I will uh, develop a little debate between Stein and Ingo first on the specific aspects, labor market, education system. Um, but I will pick up on your questions uh, later. So Stein, my first question to you is, uh, will the next e uh, employment outlook be written by ChatGPT? 
Thank you very much, David. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. The uh, no, it, what I read in your question or how I understand it is what one thing that is very new about tools like ChatGPT, but also I think AI in general, is that, and I haven't actually shown these statistics, but we have them, is that it's higher skilled occupations that are most exposed to these new technologies. Mm -hmm. And the immediate, the immediate worry or reaction would be, well, now it's the time of high skilled workers to lose their jobs. Initially, that was our hypothesis, but when we started looking at the data and at the early evidence emerging, that's not what we are seeing. Our suspected reason for that is that high skilled workers still have a lot of skills that cannot be automated. We call them bottleneck skills. So they have skills that cannot be automated. And so in their jobs, they have a far larger share of tasks that they do with skills that cannot be automated. Whereas if you look at lower skilled workers, that's not the case. They have far fewer of these bottleneck skills. And so it's still the case that lower skilled workers are at higher risk of automation. The other thing that we should say is that in general, higher skilled workers tend to be more positive about the impact of AI on their jobs. There's a little bit of evidence, but it's we need to test this later, that in fact, in occupations where computer use is high, more exposure to AI leads to higher job growth. So it, it indicates a kind of positive relationship between AI and jobs. Mm -hmm. Our suspicion, but again, this is something that we need to test, is that AI makes higher skilled workers more productive. It makes them, it, it augments them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to go back to your question about will the next employment outlook be written by ChatGPT, no. Um, might it be a tool that we use like Google or whatever to help us write uh, an employment outlook? Maybe, mm -hmm. but in the end, there will always be an OECD economist writing the, <laughs> the, the employment outlook also for reasons because we know that there's lots of issues around chat GPT and, um, and copyright issues, uh, and also that chat GPT is known to hallucinate and make things up, including references, etc. So I think it will be a long time. I might not be alive. Well, famous last words, who knows? But I, I, not the next one, at least, not the next one. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks. So I was going to ask you the same question, Ingo, will your papers be written by chat GPT? But anyway, we, we've definitely, of course, the, what was behind the question was this idea that maybe now higher skilled occupations could be more concerned in particular because the um, you know higher skilled people uh, dropped a lot right and um, uh, that's uh, that's the kind of, of work that large language uh, models can do surprisingly well and then the next question is of course i, I think the debate was on already on on, on writing code, right? Uh, can when can the computer do that? But what I found interesting, uh, Ingo, in in your comment was that you said, well, you know that we see. Well, it was interesting to see that you asked ChatGPT and not the <laughs> <laughs> economics literature. What are the three uh, skills there? Um, but what I found interesting, or a bit gloomy, perhaps, also you said, well, no, the uh, education system is not at all. Uh, prepared because it's all it's all memorization uh, and what we need is critical thinking um, I mean there I can see uh, that you still have to be able to understand whether a text that comes from chat GPT or another large language model whether it's reliable or not right um, or problem solving uh, understanding how to use uh, this tool so very convincing uh, that these would be the kind of skills that you need to use it well. But it was interesting to hear that you said, well, the today's schools don't teach that at all. Uh, and it's all memorization. So my question to you is, um, what, uh, how would the education system then have to change? So do you need to work? Do students need to work with these technologies? Do they, or is it more the teachers working with the technologies, for example, to do um, to uh, basically outsource routine tasks and have more time to work uh, with students on critical thinking and problem solving. And also, is that something, is it your impression 
uh, that you were talking about, or is it is this based in the literature basically that schools, uh, our education system uh, basically teaches memorization because you know essay writing or even math, etc. It does involve uh, problem solving, even if it's not hmm. um, with with these uh, technologies. So, what's the problem here in your mind? These were a lot of questions. Um, I, I start maybe with the with the perspective on the teachers. Yeah. Um, I have so what we already know from the numbers is that teacher shortage, so labor shortages are everywhere, and. The teacher shortage is maybe one of the most important difficulties um, for the education system for the coming 10 years, at least in Germany, that's where I know the numbers best. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there I would say it's absolutely important that teachers embrace those AI tools. Um, so most importantly in on, on the side where it automates away repetitive measures such like preparing schedules, um, doing all the admin work. So if you, there were time use surveys of teachers um, asking how much of their time they actually spend on their core pedagogical skills. That's what they are trained for and that's what they are paid for. And, and it's how small the share is that they're actually spending time on that because they have so much to do on the other side because we are lacking any kind of school administration or support stuff in German schools. So here I think that their tools could really make a difference, not as it is promised by say ed tech startups which also say, okay, it can be used for personalized learning, but as I could think of still staying in the, in the traditional way of how we teach our kids, but just mm -hmm. making each teacher much more productive by the hour, mm -hmm. by um, making them work with those AI tools. And about critical thinking and problem solving as part of, so I was exaggerating, surely. And of course, these are parts of every well-meant curriculum also in German schools. But if you think about the raw reason concerns that teachers and educational policymakers raised about AI um, basically destroying the traditional way of assessment, mm -hmm. this already tells you something about how, these, how we at least test the knowledge we are teaching. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be of a concern if we would design um, student assessments in a way that they would actually have to apply critical thinking and problem solving, because then AI would not be able to fully write exams and term papers as it is currently doing. So um, mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of uh, scope for, for, for the increase of how we should teach um, critical thinking and problem solving in schools. Right. OK, great. Thanks for the answer. And I have a very uh, well interesting uh, question uh, that I'm going to put to you, perhaps, Stan, from Thomas Obst, uh, who's basically asking here from the audience, what are the professions and occupations that you think could become completely obsolete because of AI? And then he's citing Hal Varian, who said since the 1960s, uh, he's aware of only one profession that actually disappeared because of tech or the digitalization, and that's the elevator operator. I'm, I'm not sure you can't think of others, but still it would be interesting from you to know. So what's what's more important, professions disappearing or professions changing so much that there's an urgent pressure to adjust, in particular, adjusting skills? No, it's a very good question. I, I don't think I have the question. I mean, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball here and I won't be able to tell you, especially with just AI, what occupations would entirely disappear there may be some but i can't think of any now but what i can do is i can talk a little bit about these automation uh, risk estimates of the oecd and what they tell about the occupations at highest risk of automation so you know despite all the hype around ai and you know the legal professions management professions uh, business professions being most exposed to ai technologies these are still the occupations at the lowest risk of automation. It's really, when you look at the, at the other end of the spectrum, at the occupations that are at highest risk of automation, it's occupations in the transport sector, it's occupations in the kind of repair and maintenance uh, sector, uh, also in farming, uh, there's a high risk of automation, 
uh, in construction and extraction. So it's those jobs that still face the highest risk of automation. It's also a fine line, and this is my final comment on this, between a job disappearing and changing to such an extent that it may no longer be recognizable. I mean, if you think, of, for example, about fruit picking, it may be that AI and AI augmented robots become so good that they do fruit picking. And I think there's already examples of these kind of technologies. So the traditional job of actually picking fruit might disappear, but these jobs might turn into jobs that are more in terms of supervising the AI and following the AI and the, and the, and the technology. So it doesn't directly answer your question, but my expectation is that we're really talking more about jobs changing rather than jobs uh, completely disappearing. Yeah, and Ingo, you were raising your hand to it, but uh, I actually have a um, have a question, a concrete question that links to you, um, that relates to this and to your presentation. Because I've, again, I found it interesting. You asked ChatGPT, but then you said, you know, using this tool, you need critical thinking. So when you ask uh, ChatGPT a question like, "What are the top three skills?" Um, you know what what does the machine tell you is that going to be the answer is that going to be what you find in the literature uh, do you still have to go to the literature and look what's reliable and what isn't uh, so basically yeah what's your critical thinking behind using so let me tool? be completely honest this slide i made up like 20 minutes before we met here and um i not only asked ChatGPT once but i asked ChatGPT about five times until it came up with the answer that was in line with my reading of the literature. <laughs> um, so this is how it came up. So that was my critical thinking about that. Um, I didn't like what ChatGPT told me because it was not what I was, how I understand it from the literature. And so I asked it again and it came up with a different answer. And um, so I asked it again and again, and finally I had the one screenshot I could put on my slides. So this is the critical thinking that was involved in that process. And this is how, and this is, relates very much to what Sal said uh, earlier about um, ChatGPT hallucinating. ChatGPT is not Google. ChatGPT is not nothing that provides you with, not even with facts, which I could, as a researcher, could, could check in the literature because I don't have any references. So this is not a task I would typically use it for. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. Um, but I want to come back may maybe to, um, to Thomas Ops' question and, and Stein's answer. Um, I guess it, is a, it leads a bit to misunderstanding if we always talk about jobs being displaced or jobs being augmented. Um, so the economic literature for, for, for 20 years now sees jobs as a bundle of tasks that have to be, that has to be fulfilled by, by a worker, and the worker brings a certain skill set to the job. And I guess it's much better to understand the situation when we think about single tasks of a job being displaced, while the worker then can put much more emphasis on those tasks that remain and that cannot be replaced. And I would even question Hal Varian here, who said that the elevator operator is the only job that was fully replaced. I still think that there are elevator operators around. We just do no longer see them. They are sitting in some back office, and these are the ones that you reach when you press on the button and say, look, I'm, I'm the, the elevator stop. They are still there, but they are just, 100 times more productive because now there is one guy handling 100 elevators instead the one guy in the, in the nice suit handling only the, the, the single one. And I guess these situations are just better understood when we think about jobs as bundles of tasks of which some are replaceable and substitutable and others are complementary. Yes, but uh, perhaps uh, well, if the elevator operator was somebody who liked to meet people, his job has uh, his or her job has disappeared uh, uh, to the um, to the point of being unrecognizable, perhaps. But yes, more more productive. But I, but I see, Ingo, you are a tech optimist. You think this thing comes along and it makes me more productive, makes the elevator operator more productive, makes the teacher more productive, and um, and uh, so yeah. Perhaps another. I want to throw another uh, question into the room, basically. And start with you again, Stein, um, uh, because Ingo has just talked. So there's Matthias uh, Hasselberger who's asking, have you studied, have, has literature started to study? What are the tasks? Um, um, into which characteristics of tasks predict whether AI will actually be productivity enhancing, as Ingo seems to assume? 
for almost everything. And, uh, and then he says, how do you think the RBTC framework, which I don't know what it means, <laughs> uh, distinguishing between manual and non-manual cognitive, non uh, cognitive tasks will have to be adopted? I don't know whether you can answer that question, but the first one is definitely interesting. Do we know, so what kind of jobs will become more productive? What's, what's plausible? I, I know we don't know a lot, but um, yeah. This this is all <laughs> these are all very good questions, and I don't think we yet know the answers to these. Um, in fact, some of the top economists like David Alter are working on these issues, and also don't have. I mean, they have some ideas around this. So one thing which I've already mentioned earlier is that in high skill jobs, you have far more of these non automatable skills. And we also get early evidence of high skill jobs of AI being complementary to these skills, which makes these workers more productive. And it's often workers with higher level skills, it's workers with soft skills, um, kind of skills that cannot be automated yet. Mm -hmm. But there is an, un I think David Alder has an interesting take on some of this. Um, and you can think about this in the context of ChatGPT, for example, is, and this is the question about RBTC, which uh, routine bias technological change. The, the question here is, according to David Alter, what could happen is that some of the lower skilled or middle skilled people actually get boosted by these kind of technologies and are capable of doing things which previously they were not capable of doing. And so you might see a reduction in the kind of skills gap to some extent between higher skilled and lower skilled workers. It's an interesting idea. Um, it may well be the case in some in some jobs. Uh, for example, I can think at the OECD asked about will, will AI or ChatGPT write the next employment outlook? I think the quality of drafting between different individuals at the OECD varies and you could imagine that chat GPT might raise the overall quality of writing because it can help uh, improve the quality of writing at least at the first go and then you build on that too so I think this question is a really really interesting one and I think it's one that we need to keep monitoring and having a close look at just like we did with previous waves of technology to understand what it's actually doing to different skills groups Thanks a lot, Stein. Yeah, it would be great if you, Ingo, could uh, elaborate on it. And, and, and that's actually something I uh, I ponder about a lot. So Stein gave the um, interesting example of OECD writers who um, you know, can be great economists, but sometimes don't write so clearly or they're not English speakers. That's one thing. I have seen applications where people actually have, uh, you know, may, maybe have a small business that have difficulties writing, writing well, you know, spelling and also expressing themselves. They can basically <laughs> uh, put their uh, sentences with, which don't look very good, wouldn't look good uh, to a customer into, into an, an IT system and it spits out a very nice text, you know, so that they mm. can communicate better on WhatsApp or whatever. So, you know, we, we fear a lot uh, what AI can do to us, um, including teachers, you said, but we, we have seem to have difficulty seeing the opportunities. But you can elaborate on that or how mm. you see that or what you see in the literature so far on that. So, Steiner, also, yeah. yeah. I, sorry, I just want to say, it doesn't that also depend because we have the principles of AI, which basically the OEC principles, which basically say, you know, make sure it helps people and it doesn't do harm. Um, it depends also on how we develop AI, right? We can mm. uh, develop uh, labor augmenting AI or we can uh, develop AI or uh, other IT tools that yeah. somehow replace tasks a lot. So Stein was mentioning uh, David Orr's take um, about how, how AI may, may reduce the skill gap within applications. I guess I heard one interview by him where he was uh, using this phrase, when everybody's an expert, nobody's an expert. Um, and yeah, I was thinking about that a lot, what that also means for the incentives to acquire skills in the first place. So um, this is maybe the very long run game. So now we are talking about the, the, the period of transition and what happens over the next few years, over the 10 years. But what does it mean for our schooling system then if, if you know that, yeah, well, why should I care about proper writing, about proper spelling, 
if I have the handy ChatGPT in uh, right uh, at my fingertips and whatever I'm hacking in, and I don't care about sentences, I don't care about grammatics, I don't care about spelling, it will come out flawlessly in the end anyway. So why should I learn writing in the first place? Um, so I guess there is a serious, like, like a long-term threat of um, AI destroying a bit the incentives to acquire education uh, for some people. Um, but I'm, I'm very much also in favor of these ideas of um, AI also um, uh, supporting people like in artisan occupations, I guess. So um, I, there was, an, I guess it was an interview somewhere in, in Die Welt where uh, it was also this argument that it's not just the high skilled, but also the low skilled occupations. They still have some writing tasks. Every artisan has to write a bill um, at, at the end of whatever he did. And if he or she is, is analphabetic, he really has, uh, they really have an issue. This is a, so an analphabetism is something that even creates um, inequality also in, in very manual jobs through this few administrative tasks that you can't get rid of it. And so there actually, uh, AI software chat GPT might be the great leveler, even in those occupations, which we typically think of that they are not exposed to that technology. Um, and now I lost track of your initial question, I'm sorry. No, I think you 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 kind of asked. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah. It, it, it was about uh, can you have productivity enhancing uh, you know AI? Doesn't it depend on how we basically well how we develop people develop uh, IT? But I guess the difficulty here is that we th this might differ exactly by the skill by the task bundle that a certain mm -hmm. job represents. So the same AI will be. Very, I guess that's that's at the core of the problem. The same AI can be either skill enhancing or skill of, uh, or skill displacing uh, or task displacing, um, depending on what what particular job um, workplace you look at. So if you ask AI producers to target AI that it's only skill augmenting, it would mean to create a single AI for every particular job. But this is exactly the difference to the general purpose models we are looking at now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Stein, uh, there's one question in the audience that I haven't picked up on, but um, it perhaps helps us to talk a little bit more on the distributional impacts. We've already hypothesized upon them. And, um, but so, you know, will, is it, will it still be the case that lower skilled workers, middle skilled workers are more threatened uh, than higher skilled workers? Will all of them benefit? Can we say anything about distributional impacts? The, but the specific question from the audience is more about the spatial, the regional impact. So you said um, countries with a high share of industry seem to have more occupations that, that will change a lot. Is it possible at this stage to predict which will, what will happen from an income distribution perspective, but also from a spatial distribution perspective? It's a really good question, and it's one that I want to do a research project on but we don't have funding for it yet <laughs> because I, I do we know that with previous technologies they have had very serious spatial uh, impacts um, we've always said with robots that overall they didn't seem to have had an impact on employment but that's not true when you look when you break that down by different regions and we know that in some regions, employment has really been, been destroyed um, by, by robots. And I think it goes back to when I presented my slide on, on the risk of automation, I talked about the um, you know, kind of jobs in manufacturing. I, I talked about jobs with certain kind of skills. We would have to do a similar exercise with AI to understand by occupation, by oh. sector, where these are geographically uh, concentrated and the extent to which they will either these regions will benefit or 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 be at risk from ai one potential prediction here is that because high skilled workers are probably going to benefit from ai skills i suspect that urban areas in particular will again gain from these kind of technologies uh, going forward, but that's just that's just a hypothesis that we would need to test. I also noticed, by by the way, these are all extremely good questions. I also noticed there was another question about age, and I don't know if you wanted to come back on that later, 
but that's also a distributional question. So I can ask that now or later as you like. Go, go. Okay. Age is a really interesting question. Uh, the other one is gender. We haven't touched upon that one yet. But age is a really, really interesting question because we find that it's actually both low and high skill, uh, sorry, young and older workers who are most at risk. But, or at least where, when we ask employers about this, they identify these groups as being at highest risk. But I, I want to caveat that, um, especially the older um, argument. Some people are worried that older workers might not have the skills to work with AI and might be less inclined to want to train to work with AI. And that may be true. It may be ageism, we don't know. That's something to check. But one thing that is true is that we know that older workers tend to have better contracts. Uh, they tend to be in uh, open-end contracts. They have more, um, uh, they have more, uh, it's more expensive to get rid of them. And so they are more protected than younger workers. And so when it comes to job displacement, I suspect it's not all the workers who are going to lose their jobs. In fact, going back to all the technologies, when we when we look at, for instance, the the, the kind of the, the, the polarization story, um, for um, so the disappearance of jobs in the middle of the distri uh, distribution, most of that has not happened through getting rid of workers. Most of that has happened by young people entering different jobs than before, and I suspect that with artificial intelligence, that is also what's going to happen. I suspect that a lot of entry level jobs will be automated. And so young people will not enter these jobs these, that are highly exposed to AI, and they will have to find jobs elsewhere. The question is, how many occupations will there be that will not be exposed to AI? And so, again, this is my one worry going forward, that AI will touch upon so many occupations that the impact risks being much bigger than what we've seen with previous technologies. Yeah, thanks a lot. And we could, uh, thanks, Stein, we could go on for hours, but we're very close to the end um, of our slot here. Anyway, I do have a perhaps a final question to both of you, but I do want to start with Ingo, uh, because, you know, being labor and uh, skills economist, you focused a lot on the availability of the right skills in order to adopt uh, uh, AI. And I was wondering, um, or was surprised that nobody talk, talked about regulation and connected to that, um, perhaps the, um, how shall I put it, the societal, accept, the acceptance of, of, of AI. And, and one example is um, autonomous driving, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably quite advanced, but the, it, we, it hasn't, but it hasn't been introduced on a large scale. And people at least suspect that perhaps when the first accidents happen, although we do, do kind of know that probably fewer accidents will happen, but it will be a lot less acceptable for an autonomous car to kill a person than for a, uh, than for a person, because we kind of have this idea they will, they're still in charge somehow. So yeah, and that goes also back to the AI principles of the OECD. So doesn't it doesn't society shape it a lot? Also, what's acceptable? It, it, also, your teachers, um, Ingo, you said, yeah, but they don't want, you know, they don't want to change uh, what they're doing. But also, it's it's difficult for them, you know. They never know whether data privacy issues are not going to fire backfire. So even the teachers who would like to use more of these tools, I think they have a good reason to be cautious before their employer says, well, it's okay, you know, go. Um, how about that? Uh, regulation, societal acceptance of new of new tools. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the teaching profession is maybe the best example for uh, regulation discussions already on the way. So I guess the, maybe it's also because that's what I'm most interested in. But privacy concerns are maybe the one largest uh, reason for not adopting AI so far in, in German classrooms, uh, so the data security concerns. So I would not say that the discussion is not ongoing. I, I would just say that we are currently in, in a, so the, the, there might be some optimum regulation and there needs to be an optimum regulation um, uh, that, that has to be found through, through a societal political debate. Um, so far, I would say in Germany, when it comes to data and privacy concerns, especially in the education realm, we are much more on the side of um, way too strict uh, data security concerns. 
Yeah, staying to bring you in one last time, my initial question to you was, uh, will the next employment outlook be uh, written by uh, chat GPT? And so you said, well, you kind of said no, but it might have, but also here, I mean, internally, we have regulations, of course, because nobody really know what it does, right? So that could be one hindrance, actually, regulations uh, uh, telling you that perhaps you can use it, perhaps it could be, um, it could be beneficial, but since, Nobody really knows what comes out of it. Uh, employers regulate, uh, governments regulate, etc. And society somehow does too, perhaps informally. What's the importance of regulation for the adoption of AI and other technologies for you? So we, we actually asked employers what the barriers were to adoption so far. And cost and skills were the main one that they mentioned. Regulation came very low down. That may be because at the time of the research, there wasn't much regulation around AI yet. It, there is a possibility that regulation, especially bad regulation, uh, harms the adoption of AI. There is a possibility that, um, because I mean, there might be a cost attached to it, but if you avoid the adoption of bad AI, then that's not a bad thing. Um, and the other thing I should mention around regulation is that it actually might promote adoption because we are also in a context where many employers are not clear on what the legislation says around AI, what they can, what they cannot do, say around automatic decision making, around the use of AI in recruitment, you know, what, what is actually, at what point do they run a risk if they use AI? And I think clarity is really important here for promoting the adoption of AI. Yeah, but that, that's basically, yeah, but but that's uh, why sometimes employers say don't use it because it's not so clear you know, what, what uh, how it's going to be, um, um, well, accepted by customers or, or whatever, or by the, by the law. Anyway, so this was a really inspiring discussion. Thank you, Stein. Thank you, Ingo. And also thank you, the audience, for all these uh, uh, interesting questions. Um, I mean, you showed so much critical thinking and data literacies that I'm really uh, uh, that I'm really positive uh, that uh, in the future researchers and employment outlook uh, drafters will be augmented by uh, large language models and not be replaced. It was a lot of fun. I know you will have to ha do a lot of research to understand what AI actually does do to the labor market and what the, the requirements are for the education system. So I'm sure and I hope we'll meet again on this when some more knowledge has uh, been accumulated. And thank you very much and uh, have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Bye.